Have you ever found a leaf with weird little balls or spiky things attached to it? Or found a plant with a weird growth on its stem? Or a dense clump of leaves growing out of an odd place? Well, chances are those were galls. Going into this conversation, I knew a little bit about galls, but not very much at all. However, what I did know was pretty interesting. So I wanted to learn more, and I thought you might be interested in learning more about them too. My mind was almost instantly blown. Galls are so much more diverse and interesting and amazing than I ever dreamed of. I hope you find this conversation as fascinating as I did. Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, please visit my Patreon page. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. Today we are joined by Louis Nastasi. Louis is a PhD candidate at Penn State's Frost Entomological Museum which is Penn State's research collection of insects and other arthropods. Hi, Lewis. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have a very fun conversation about some of my research topics and something I think your listeners will find really interesting. Yes, I am extremely excited about this conversation too, because I think it's going to be so fun because galls are just those weird growth-like things that we find on stems and leaves. And a lot of times we don't know what in the world they are. And there's a few galls that I know. And I can go, oh yeah, that's a blah, blah, blah gall and tell a little bit about it. But there's a lot that I don't know. Um, a lot more that I don't know than I do know. So I'm looking forward to learning more myself with this. I'm very glad to hear that. But before we get started, can you just tell us a little bit about how you got interested in studying galls? Yes, yeah, so that is a great question. So before I started grad school, my background was in parasitic wasps. Uh, and that's pretty much a tremendously diverse group of insects. They do all different crazy things. And most of them are true parasites. They will lay their eggs in other insects. Usually they're host specific. So one type of parasite only attacks one type of host and so on. But Within that enormous diversity of parasitic wasps, there is a group of wasps that have evolved to make galls. And we don't really know, you know, what evolutionary pressures have forced them into this behavior. And when you really start to look at the biology of wasps in general, their biology is just phenomenal. I know I've said diverse so many times already, but it's just so, so, so tremendously diverse. You have multiple groups that have evolved to be specific parasites of one type of insect. But their sister group, the one that evolved directly from them, said, no, I'm going to go eat plants instead. And then other groups do all other kinds of crazy things. So uh, my main motivation in studying galls was I'd found not only this interest in parasitic wasps, but a real interest in trying to learn more about why they do the things they do. You know, it's kind of unusual to see that in a group of insects, you switch between so many different lifestyles in such a small amount of time, or at least what we think is a small amount of time. And I think gall wasps in particular are a really great example of the kind of biological transitions we see in insects. So that's really what really got my brain super engaged on the idea of galls. They're just so out of left field for the biology of the group I was already studying. And that's really what drew me in. And that's so often the story. You start off looking at one thing and that leads you down a different hole. And then it's like, oh my gosh, there's all these other fun things. And at least for me, that's the way I've learned. And a lot of my interests have gone. I mean, wildlife biology is what I majored in in college and what I've studied and stuff like that. But the different areas of that, it's been, oh, I'm interested in this. But wait a minute, how does that interact with this? And then down the rabbit hole I go. And Absolutely. it's so fascinating and fun. 
And once you really start to learn about nature, I mean, I've realized that my way of thinking has completely changed. Well, I'm no longer looking at a leaf. I think, well, what else is living on this leaf? What is this little spot on the leaf that's not on this other leaf? Like you just go in so many different directions once you're opened up to that, that true state of nature where it's really just a giant web of interactions. And what you're seeing is not to wax too philosophically, but it's really just this tiny snapshot in time. And that encapsulates all these interactions. And that's what I find so fascinating about nature. Yes, exactly. So let's start at the beginning. What is the gall? So this is one of those fun questions that I'd like to say as a really simple answer, but it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, very generally, a gall is a piece of plant tissue that has been modified by the activity of another organism. So most commonly, galls that we see will be induced by insects. Uh, there are also mites and nematodes that can make galls. Uh, some bacteria and viruses call the cause the growth of galls as well. But the most common galls you'll see you know, in your garden or going for a hike are galls induced by insects like wasps or midges. Uh, but there are some dicey elements to defining a gall. We see uh, most common galls that you notice right away are large, conspicuous, colorful, have weird kinds of textures. Uh, but a lot of gall inducers actually, like the wasps that I study, are a little different. A lot of them actually make what we call cryptic galls that are completely inconspicuous. You'd never know they were there. And then if you cut a piece of stem open, you'd see a little insects and in chambers living inside. They've clearly modified this plant tissue, but not to the extent that you'd see in something like an oak apple or a large goldenrod gall, where there's this clear modification. So when we talk about, you know, what modified actually means, we're talking about a lot of different uh, dynamic levels of, again, interaction between these plants, the various things that make them, and then what it means to be modified on things like chemical or structural levels. So to uh, tie all that together and give a really, um, as basic a definition as I can, a gall is a plant structure that has been modified in some tangible way by another organism. Again, most commonly an insect, but also various other critters as well. Yeah, and that's, that's really interesting because all the galls that I've really paid attention to notice, like you said, are the big flashy ones. I never even thought about galls being inside the stem and cryptic where you can't even tell that they're there or nematodes or those other things creating galls. I mean, I'm thinking mostly insects, most except for like the big, big galls that you sometimes find on trunks of trees. That's a totally yeah, different yeah. story. But for most of them, I'm thinking the insects are causing them and you see them. They're not, like you said, the cryptic hidden ones. That's just fascinating. It's really fascinating. And it actually presents a, quite a tremendous challenge when it comes to studying uh, the insects that induce these cryptic galls. Because if you can't see a gall, you know, how do you know that they're there? So That's that, what I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, what that usually involves. And uh, not to get too into how we study galls right at the top of the show, but what I often have to do is go to a site and say, okay, I know that this plant is supposed to have cryptic galls in it. So I find a few stems, I'll dissect one or two of them, and just, you have to blindly see if they're there. And sometimes you get lucky and the first stem you cut open is infested with all different crawling insects. And sometimes you cut up a dozen stems and you say to yourself, I guess they really don't live here. And that's often just how it goes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, must take a lot of dedication to study some of those. And I do want to talk about some of that. But let's, like you said, let's leave that to a little bit later <laughs> in the, later in the conversation so that we can at least everybody have an idea of what in the world we're talking about. And some of those basics Absolutely. that I know I've got a very, very, very basic understanding of, mm -hmm. but I don't know all the details and I need more background too on it really to understand, I think. Absolutely. So uh, one thing I'll say before we get too far into this is I am an entomologist. I specifically study insects uh, and my understanding of plants is mostly tied to the insect end of things. So I'm not super familiar with all the really crazy molecular things that plants have going on. Uh, but what I find most interesting, again, are the elements of the insects that interact with them. So with that as a very basic disclaimer, uh, let's talk about some of the more uh, interesting elements of galls and why people might want to know about them. Yes. And I'm right there with you. I'm not <laughs> a plant person. Um, I'm not a molecular person for any organism. I like the interactions. I like the organism level that's where I excel and that's where my interest is and that's what 
that's what it's all about in some ways is finding your interest and going with that, I think. Absolutely. So we've talked about, you mentioned some of the different types of organisms, the nematodes and stuff like that, but I'm going to guess nematodes are more root. Actually, I am not 100% sure about that, but what I can tell you uh, before we focus on nematodes is only a few nematodes uh, do make galls. So if we want to talk about the level of commonality of different gall makers that you might find, mm -hmm. uh, the first step in discussing that is knowing what plants you have around, uh, because the actual type of plant you're looking at also radically determines which gall inducers you can find on that plant. So most of the common galls you might see, at least in more temperate regions like North America, are galls on oak trees, uh, the genus Quercus. And now that is a really interesting uh, plant as far as uh, gall inducers, because they have a really tremendous diversity, both in terms of species, but also higher groups that make gall. So if you go to an oak tree, you might find on one leaf a mite gall, you might find on one of the twigs a gall induced by a cynipid wasp. And if you look at the underside of a different leaf, you might find a midge gall. So oaks are what we often consider to be kind of the, the heartland of gall diversity in temperate systems. But I've kind of learned to not focus on oak galls as much now that my research mostly uh, considers herb galls. Those are galls on herbaceous plants, uh, plants more or less that don't necessarily persist over multiple years. Uh, the plant itself might live for a long time, but they'll usually put up one stem that lasts one year. And within those stems or on the other parts of that plant, you find a really enormous diversity of galls, honestly, similar to what you'd see in oaks. And what my study is slowly uncovering is that things like gall wasps do generally uh, get on herbs a lot more commonly than originally we thought. And it, they also encompass a wider diversity of host plants than what we'd originally thought. So as far as what your listeners might encounter on an average day, uh, if you go outside and take a look at your garden, if you have an oak tree out there, uh, you might want to take a look at the leaves of that plant, of the twigs, and see what's living on there. Uh, other than that, one of the most common hosts for galls that I encounter are asters, uh, the plant family Asteraceae, the composite flowers. Uh, they will often have a tremendous diversity of midges, of wasps, and a bunch of other critters that make galls in the flowers, the stems, the leaves, all over the place. And that's another really interesting element of galls is we often see that species are specific to not just the plant, but also the structure of the plant. So a gall that you might find on the stem of a goldenrod plant is likely a different species than that you'd find on the lower stem or the roots or the leaves or in the flowers. So when we talk about galls, we're not just talking about, okay, well, all the galls on an oak are made by one species. What we're really talking about is these really, really close-knit systems where the leaf of one oak is a different gall than that found on the leaf of a different oak, even right next to each other. And what I think is really phenomenal is my work is mostly on prairie systems, is I can go to a prairie, look at two different plants right next to each other, and they have different gall wasps on them, even if they're the same plant species in the same place. And that is just really mind blowing to me when considering the diversity of these insects here. Yes, definitely. And that's you just touched on a bunch of different things that I, I wanted to go more in depth <laughs> on, um, which is awesome. I love it because, yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering. What's the commonality? Which ones are more common? Because most of the ones I know are like midges, flies, wasps, wasps especially. And then like you were saying, the plants, oaks and things in the Asteraceae family. I find a lot of stuff on those are really the two that I see the most on. But yeah, it's so interesting. And how picky they these insects can be too, as far as like you said, Absolutely. some are only on this species, some are only on that species, some are only on the leaves or the stem or the it's it's so interesting. And there are even weird cases where one species will only appear on two different plants that are not necessarily closely related. And that makes us ask. Well, why is that? Were they originally on more different plants and some populations died off while others didn't? There are a lot of really unusual ecosystem dynamics implicit in discussing gall-inducing insects. Do we have any idea on some of those or is that still really? Yeah, so uh, there's actually one species that I'm working on. It is the rosinweed terminal stem gall wasp. Uh, they induce galls on plants of the genus Silphium, the rosinweeds that are pretty common in Midwestern North America. And one thing that we're, that I'm currently studying is whether the species called Antistrophus sylphii is one species or multiple species. 
And when we look at the actual host plant interactions, it is on, uh, so far we know of two host plants. One is Sylphium integrifolium called whole leaf rosin weed, and the other is cup plant, Sylphium perfoliatum. Now what I'm seeing in the other uh, wasps in this genus is they like only one host plant or only a couple really, really closely related host plants. And by that, I mean, you know, these two species are the most evolutionarily related to one another. But in this one case, this species uh, is on two completely different host plants that are not seemingly related. But when we look at whether or not they're the same species, the puzzle is quite unusual because they're completely identical anatomically and genetically, they're also very similar. So there are some really weird questions that I'm asking in my research for species such as this, where we look at the what we call the evolution of host use. So which host plants gall inducers are on, how those plants are related to one another, and then how the gall wasps on those plants are related to other gall wasps. And in the case of Antistrophus sylphii, things are a little complicated because it looks like they are completely independent populations in terms of their biology. Uh, by that, I mean, in this specific case, the gall wasps from one host plant emerge and are active at an entirely different time from those on the other host plant. But again, they're I mostly identical in elements of genetics and their appearance. So we get into, I don't want to get too deep into this on this podcast, but we get into, you know, what is a species? How do these populations interact? And when we're talking about these plant associated organisms, that host plant relationship is often an anchor we can reference. And unfortunately, in the case of this gall wasp, the host plant is not super useful because again, they're very um, evolutionarily distinct plants not to the degree where we, we could you know never expect to see the same species on them, but distinct enough where it makes me raise an eyebrow and think to myself, what's really going on here? So that's a bit of a complex example that I'm currently dealing with, but it hopefully gives an idea of some of the more unusual aspects of dealing with these gall inducing insects. Yeah, I, I, I'm like you, I could go down some really deep rabbit holes. I've got all these questions in my head now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so are these, cryptic ones or yeah, so the, these are probably some of the more obvious galls you can expect to find so these galls are quite large uh, i'm trying to think of a good size usually larger than a golf ball oh wow and they grow on the tops of these stems and they're usually really distinct because once these galls form the stem usually stops growing so you both you can uh, look for the galls themselves or you can just look and see well you know that stems a lot shorter than the others i wonder if there's a gall on there and more often than not, you'll go over there and see this club gall, kind of a weird ball-shaped structure that's kind of long and weird and amorphous sitting on the top of that plant. And that's where those gall wasps are developing and living. Interesting. Because I know, I mean, you said it, sylphiums are more Midwestern. And yeah, that's where they're most common at. But in many parts of the Eastern U.S., especially Southeastern U.S., there were some barrens. There were prairies here, a lot more than have often been given credit for. We do find sylphiums growing in this area. Um, a lot of times sylphiums are planted and gardens or prairie recreations and stuff like that. And I've got cup plant growing in my garden. I love it. Mm -hmm. It's taking over and I need to move it out of one of the beds into <laughs> a little bit wilder area, but I absolutely love it. Um, and I've never seen that. So now I'm going to have to start watching yeah, so the really fascinating thing with the sylphium system, and one of the main reasons I'm so drawn toward it, is it's so underexplored. The gall wasps that we know of on sylphium were all first discovered in about 1891. And, you know, that's a really, really long time ago. And my question is always, well, what's changed since then? What do we know since then? And in the case of the sylphium gall wasps, uh, there's only one study that's been published since the year 2000 by a collaborator of mine. And beyond that, nothing's been published in the last century. So no one's really been working on these sylphium gall wasps. And what I've found is even though there's been a paucity of research, there are a lot of unknown species that no one's ever seen before. So if you are there in the Southeast, the, the sylphium flora you might encounter relative to that in the Midwest is quite different, but the gall wasps that live on those plants are also quite different. And so far, uh, every sylphium plant that I've sampled has shown evidence of galls on it, but there are only seven described species in association with sylphium, and there are only four host plants. So that's a really great example. We're gonna talk about this, I'm hoping a little later. Mm -hmm. This is a great case that showcases, you know, no one is really studying galls in a way that really allows us to understand their biodiversity. And 
you know, in the last couple of decades, there's been a kind of a resurgence in understanding the diversity of gall inducing insects. But, you know, that still leaves decades and decades where these organisms haven't really been researched. And the Sophium system is a really great example of that, where I'm currently predicting there are probably 50 or more species of gall wasps only using Sophium as host plants, yet only that seven are currently known to science. So that's a really uh, interesting example. And I think a great way for us to jump off into our further discussions of galls in this episode. Yes, exactly. And very exciting too, because noticing and learning about and describing new species is always exciting because you can't, you can't do anything. You can't protect, you can't conserve. You can't even know if it needs protecting and conserving if you don't know it exists. So that's always like the first step in anything. Absolutely. You know, that might actually be a really fascinating podcast topic also for a future episode. Why yes. are naming and describing species? Why is that such an important aspect of modern science? Yes, I like that. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. We definitely will have to have a conversation like that. But you were talking about how you can sometimes have two plants of the same species right next to each other, and they have maybe different insects in them, or one will have one and one will have nothing. Do we have any idea why the insects pick this individual over that individual? Yeah, so that's a really phenomenal question. And I'm disappointed to say we honestly don't understand that mechanism very well at this point in time. We do have some general theories, though. Uh, one that I'm partial to is the idea that the actual genetic makeup of a plant changes how appealing it is to various gall-inducing insects. So imagine for a moment that you are a gall wasp right? You have your little antennae flicking around. You have all your sensory structures picking up every molecule in the air around you. It's a really different experience from being a human. And I think that understanding that sensory difference will help us understand why a plant might be more appealing. So if you're a gall wasp, you're looking for the ideal location to lay your eggs so that your offspring can go make a gall, survive, grow and develop, and then go off and continue that cycle. So what you need to look for as a gall wasp is a plant that is the most nutritive, for your offspring, a plant that is relatively healthy and unlikely to succumb to an illness that would prevent your offspring from reaching adulthood, many different aspects of understanding what an ideal host plant truly is. So insects have a tremendous diversity of sensory structures, like I just implied, their antennae have all kinds of what we call sensilla, or basically receptors on them that pick up all kinds of molecules, all kinds of tactile responses like touch, feeling, texture, all these different things. And it makes sense to think that, you know, one tiny gene modification in a plant can completely change how that plant feels to an insect that's interacting with this plant. And, you know, when we as humans pick up a plant and touch it and feel it, you know, we're at a completely different scale than an insect would be. The gall wasps that I work on are usually only a few millimeters long. So if you imagine the sensation that insect might receive from touching a plant with its antenna, that's dramatically different from a human being touching a plant with your fingers that are dramatically larger. So it makes sense thinking that, you know, a really, really tiny gene change in a plant might make it, you know, slightly fuzzier, slightly less fuzzier, slightly hairier, something to that effect. And that might change whether an insect is willing to lay its eggs and try to induce a gall on that particular plant. And as far as other things, one theory I have as to why sylphium might be such a good plant candidate for galls is they have various chemical elements that might make them more appealing. So rosin weeds, as the name slightly implies, produce a resinous compound that gives off various chemicals into the environment. And one reason they might be more appealing to gall induction is the wasp can pick up on those various chemical off-gassings and determine this plant's super attractive to me over these other plants. And the reason I like that theory a lot is at least as far as the gall wasps that induce galls on asteraceous plants, we see preference for the genus Lactuca, the lettuces, for gall wasp, and they produce that milky sap that mm -hmm. also serves that same role. And some other closely related plants also do that. But, you know, to say those as two possible theories, that does not mean that all gall inducers rely on those same mechanisms for choosing a host plant. And one thing I want to get out here before we talk a little more about this is that what we call galls are not necessarily the same phenomenon at the base of it. Gall induction has evolved many, many times across different organisms. Within insects, there are many different groups that have simultaneously evolved the ability to induce galls. And even within the gall wasps, 
there are also multiple origins, or at least we suspect there are multiple origins of the ability to induce galls. So when we're talking about galling, we're really talking about multiple different behaviors that all result in the same type of phenomenon. So when you look at a gall on one plant induced by a wasp versus another plant induced by a fly, you know, it's kind of the same concept. We understand they're both galls, they're both modifications of that plant tissue, but the way that a wasp seeks out a host plant is likely entirely different than the way that that gall midge would seek out a host plant. And with that idea in mind, we can talk about, you know, how different organisms interact with a plant before they even get into the gall making process. When we talk about a bacterium, you know, it's probably not sitting there touching the plant and thinking, is this where I want to make a gall? It's probably responding to an entirely different set of stimuli than what a gall wasp is responding to. And that's also important for us to consider when we're trying to think about why one individual plant might be of interest over another. Yeah, and those are very good points. And yeah, things that I think we forget or overlook and just don't think about a lot of times is that, so we like to lump things. We like to categorize things. And if they look the same, we put them together. Uh, and that's just part of human nature. But just because some of these galls look similar and a lot of them don't look anything alike, doesn't mean that it's all the same process, like you're saying. And, and then when you start talking about different organisms causing it, of course, it's not exactly the same. But I think that is something, like you said, that we forget too often and that we do need to make sure we bring to the forefront and say. Absolutely. And one thing I also like to bring awareness to, as I've mentioned, is, you know, we're so used to experiencing nature and interacting with it in a human way. Because again, we're, we're humans. Mm -hmm. We can't really imagine what it's like to be a fly or a beetle or a wasp, right? That's such a massive disconnect for, even for me, someone that spends countless hours staring at these things, watching them, understanding them. You know, I can't imagine what it's like to be that wasp. And I think that when we start to kind of strip away that idea that we've developed as humans in interacting with nature, that leads us to some really interesting ideas about, you know, how these organisms might be interacting. And one thing that I always think of is taste. So, Insects, again, having these tremendous diversities of sensory receptors experience taste in a way very different from us. And when we think of an oak plant or an oak tree having a really high concentration of tannins in their tissue, these bitter compounds that don't make them taste very good to humans, that's something we think might be drawing various oak gall wasps to that plant because those tannins might prevent parasites from infesting galls. They might prevent fungal growth in some cases. And just, just very basic ideas like that end up being really influential. We're trying to understand the mechanisms that go into why galls exist the way that they do. Yeah, that is very interesting and fascinating because like you said, we tend to think of, think of everything from a human perspective or at least a mammal perspective. Yes. And so tannins make things better. Things don't eat them. But in this case, that could potentially be a good thing. And it Absolutely. makes sense. And a fun fact on the oak galls there, we actually can use those tannins for a few purposes. Uh, if you've ever looked at really ancient handwritten manuscripts, you might notice this rich dark brown ink. And that in many cases is actually made from oak galls. The tannins in the actual galls themselves actually allow them to retain this really dark crisp coloration after drying. So what we've learned to do is combine various chemicals with oak galls and turn them into ink. So that's one example uh, from something we'll hopefully talk about is why do we care about galls? And I think that just the tannins example is a really interesting one because we go from, you know, the human experience to the insect experience back to the human experience. These tannins are kind of this weird circle in a weird way where they make them unappealing to predators, to mammals and so on. To make them possibly appealing to a gall inducing insect because that means some level of guaranteed protection. But then humans come along and say, well, you know what, we can't eat those, but we can do other things with them. And those tannins end up being really, really influential on that end of things. Yes, very interesting and fascinating. So, just real quick, what's the impact of the gall on the plant? Or is there any sort of Impact. And I know that's a very broad question because it's probably going to be different depending on what type of plant we're talking about and what type of gall we're talking, insect. And, but in general, I mean, is this a negative effect on the plant or not? Yeah, you nailed it with your assumption here that it's a bit more nebulous than we'd like it to be. Every gall impacts an individual plant differently. 
And then we talk about things like how many galls are on that plant, how concentrated are they, what type of tissue is the gall on. Generally, I would speculate that most galls are not directly harmful to the plant. You know, they're just an expansion of plant tissue. And for the most part, plants don't really care too much to being used or modified by various other organisms. And because of that, you know, nature's developed these really complex symbiotic interactions between various organisms and plants. And that's one of the main reasons we see that these different insects are so diverse. As the plants diversify, so too do their insect associates. But there are cases where the galls are absolutely harmful. Now, they're not as common um, as far as, you know, what are the odds that a gall is harming a plant? There are much fewer cases of galls causing conspicuous harm than there are of galls not really impacting a plant. Uh, but in the case of oak trees, there are a couple of species of oak gall wasps that are known to be pests, um, often in ornamental contexts. You know, they make leaves fall off, they make stems look weird. And, you know, I find them interesting as a scientist, but, you know, a lot of people don't think of a gall as being a pleasant looking structure on a plant. Maybe that's a disconnect that we can elaborate on further later, but another thing to consider. But overall, uh, the vast majority of the time, the galls being induced on a plant do not harm that plant. Weird, odd question I just thought of. Are there any instances that we know of where having the gall helps the plant or is a positive? Wow, that is a question I hadn't considered before. <laughs> um, I hadn't either. It just popped in my head as we were talking. I mean, there's almost, you know what? Actually, there's a... Um, no, that's not a true gall, is it? All right, already in my head, I'm like digging for examples, trying to think of what a gall truly is. I would say we really don't know enough about plant gall interactions to have a definitive answer to that. I mean, it might be the case that a gall forming on a leaf stops caterpillars from feeding on that leaf. They're probably weird um, tritrophic interactions. These interactions that involve many different levels of ecology, mm -hmm. there's likely some help to a plant in many cases. I can't think of an example. I, I would argue that we just don't know enough about galls in general to make generalizations on something like that in particular. There's got to be something out there where the plant is like, give me all the galls you can give me so that it wards off, you know, plant feeding insects or something else of that sort. I'm just not sure if we have any concrete examples. And maybe we do, but I have yet to come across them myself. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking is that we wouldn't know the answer to that. And if there is one, then like you, I'm going into the how would it, that third, fourth level down. Mm -hmm. And then I guess part of the question is, what's a benefit? What's a negative? How do we Absolutely. define that on that, a That is a level? human term we're applying to a system that does not operate on human terms, right? So we see, oh, the plant is being harmed as a negative, but maybe that plant wants to be harmed so it releases certain compounds into the environment to attract predators to eat the insects that are damaging the plant tissue. You know, plants work in these abstract, crazy ways that humans obviously can't really understand in a lot of senses, but that's why talking about these insect-plant interactions is so fascinating because it leads us down all these roads where we think, well, we think of that as a negative. We perceive it as a bad thing, but maybe it isn't. Maybe the plant is specifically orchestrating this interaction at a really unusual level. All these different rabbit holes. When you start looking at interactions, it's just like there's no stop to it because Absolutely. everything's interacting in different ways. And then what levels are we looking at? And because, I mean, we both said we're not molecular people, but there's a lot of molecular stuff going on. We're just not, we're looking at different levels with it. Absolutely. And when I do look at a molecular context, it's evolution related. So when mm -hmm. we're talking about what compound makes a plant attractive, I say, let me ask someone else. If we ask questions of why did this interaction evolve, we can look back in time using molecular techniques and start to understand what aspects might be playing roles in that interaction. So we've kind of touched on this a couple of times. Let's dive in. Why are galls important? Well, that is a tremendous question. I'm so excited to talk about it, but if I get going, it's going to be a three hour episode. <laughs> uh, but to give a very basic overview of why galls are important, um, you know, before we dive too deep into that, let's bring up how galls interact with other organisms in a more general sense, okay. and that'll lead us into the importance quite neatly. So when we think of a gall, you know, you think of it as this weird plant structure. 
either it's some kind of ball looking thing that's grown out of a stem or it's some weird scraggly outgrowth of a leaf, something to that effect. But what we all often do not see is what's actually going on inside that gall. So if we take a gall and we cut it in half, what we see on the inside are individual units, uh, for lack of a better term, where the organisms inside the gall are living. For something that exhibits kind of a more complicated galling process, like a gall wasp, you might see defined chambers carved out of the plant tissue. In the case of other organisms, there might just be like a cavity or an opening. But in there are typically the gall-inducing insects themselves. But as we know from our discussions of nature, every time something exists, other organisms learn to exist in that context. So in the case of galls, we don't just have the gall-inducing insect. We have an enormous diversity of other organisms that want the resources and safety provided by that gall and want to get it at any means necessary. So when we talk about gall systems, we need to talk about not just the gall itself, but all these other interactions. And one thing that we commonly see across insect-induced galls, and I touched on this earlier, are parasitic insects that want to take advantage of that gall. Now, the most common example of this are parasitic wasps of various lineages. There is a tremendous diversity of parasitic wasps that attack galls specifically so they can take over that gall and use it for their own protection. And to make things even more interesting, there are also parasitic wasps that only attack parasitic wasps that are already in galls. And as we can imagine, it expands outwardly from there. There is a parasitic wasp that only attacks parasites of parasites of parasites of galls and so on. So to illustrate their importance in a very broad sense, a lot of different organisms depend directly on galls for their own survival, their reproduction, their maintenance of appropriate population sizes, and so on. And we've only so far touched on the insect end of things, but there are also other organisms that will eat galls in a more direct context. And in fact, humans have been known to eat galls in many cases. There are some anecdotes, especially in Europe and you know, going back centuries, of people finding oak apple galls on oak trees and eating them like apples because they're highly nutritious. I mean, they are just plant tissue. They're as nutritious as a general plant can be in most contexts. And oak apples are generally large enough. I mean, I can fit one in my hand pretty comfortably and you can just take a bite out of it like you would an apple. Uh, people have also historically used galls to feed livestock, but in the more you know ecosystem context, many vertebrates or other organisms also feed on galls. So there are cases of birds eating galls, mammals will eat galls. Uh, my advisor likes to run a trail cam out by his house and he started getting a itty bitty micro trail cam. And what he was doing was leaving galls on a plate and putting a camera there and seeing what came up and moved them around or ate them. And he found that a lot of small mammals like mice often will eat galls, you know, nibble on them for some excess nutrients. Some will even take them with them, which I find is quite fascinating. And then to expand on that further, a lot of organisms feed on galls in a less direct sense. There are some galls that produce nectar, specifically galls on oaks. And there are lots of organisms that will you know, want to eat that nectar. It's highly nutritious, high in sugars, high in various compounds that other insects will want. So you might often see ants or yellow jackets clustered around an oak gall and drinking nectar directly out of the gall. So what I want to emphasize here is galls are kind of this multidimensional, all-encompassing community phenomenon in a way where lots of other organisms in those same systems depend on galls for some amount of their own survival, or in some cases for all of their survival. Uh, the parasites of galls are, as we might guess, often host specific. So you might find a parasite on one type of gall that is not found from other types of galls. And through that, we not only gain an understanding of the diversity associated with galls, but we start to understand, again, this host specificity, where a gall is only on a certain plant, and certain other organisms will only interact with that certain gall that only occurs on that certain plant. And we can apply that also to things like geography, where certain galls are only found in certain places, and therefore those other associates can only exist in those places because the gall exists in that place in that time. So galls are really, on an ecosystem level, just these tremendous sources of ecosystem diversity, even in ways we probably don't understand today. So that's probably what I would reiterate as the most important function of galls. They're like the foundations of you know, an oak ecosystem or an herbaceous plant ecosystem. 
And we're really just starting to understand what those ecosystems look like in a really strict sense. That is mind blowing and fascinating because the only time I've ever heard people eating galls are the dares that little kids do with the little golden rod apple galls or something like that. Uh, dare you, dare you type sort of things. And yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with like with the insect formed galls, having the little grubs or the larva inside of there. So like chickadees and nuthatches and downy woodpeckers going after them in the winter. Woodpeckers especially. Mm -hmm. And then of course, I knew that some of those had parasitoids of them, but yeah, I never really thought about the different levels of parasites on there Absolutely. or even the idea that they would some of the galls produce nectar and have those extra floral nectaries around them producing. I mean, that's just brings in a whole nother level of interaction and interest in Absolutely. more rabbit holes. We can go down and spend another three hours on. I would love to do that. <laughs> um, but the, the really interesting thing we see about galls is again, we consider them to be kind of this one thing, just this modified plant tissue, but like every gall is so different from every other gall that it really complicates our ability to really understand how galls interact with other organisms or what a gall even is. So at the beginning of the show, when I said it's kind of hard to define a gall, all these galls are so different. And I, I really hope that this conversation so far is really illustrating that diversity. Again, the nectar producing galls are something that is really just starting to be understood. My lab has an ongoing project to examine those, but like no one's really thought to care about them too much. And on that note, we're also realizing that ant interactions with galls are also increasingly important. Uh, there is a habit called myrmecophory, where ants will move things like seeds or insect eggs all around, uh, obviously to eat them or for what they think are their own motivations. Uh, but they also do the same thing with galls. And there are gall wasps that we currently understand to need to be transported to ant nests in order to properly survive. So not to get too deep into that, but like, oh my God, these things are crazy. They're super diverse. They do all these different things. And by doing these things, you know, they're promoting these other organisms in their own ecosystem. So they're really, I, I would arguably call them cornerstone species for that reason. You know, we think of cornerstone species being a little more kind of larger in a sense, but like at its core, that really is what a gall does. A single gall supports the existence of many, if not dozens of species that couldn't exist if that gall were not there. So to that end, it's just really exceptional to see how these things exist in their natural states. Yes, exactly. And I knew galls were complicated and not just one thing. <laughs> that is an understatement. But I never imagined that they were this complicated and diverse and different. I mean, what I'm getting is that talking about galls is... In some ways, worse than talking about pollinators, because, I mean, we think pollinators and we, everybody thinks pollinators, one thing, but I mean, you've got insects of all different kinds. You've got mammals in some countries and parts of the world. You've got, I mean, just all these different things that are pollinators, and that doesn't even come close to the diversity that I'm seeing and hearing about as you're talking about galls. Yes. And I want to take another moment to highlight how under-researched galls are as a whole. So these are the things that we know about. These are the things that we know exist and that have been studied. But what else is out there? You know, yeah. the galls are not well studied. The, the areas of the world that we know the most about galls are currently temperate North America and temperate Europe. And some parts of Asia, like China, has been undergoing a gall renaissance recently. But tropical regions are horribly undersampled. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no herb gall wasps in South America that have been discovered so far, which is crazy to think about considering how diverse plants are down there. Yeah, you think there'd be a million of them. Absolutely. And we, we could even think about maybe there's like some kind of biogeographic component to that. But like these, these plants are so diverse in these places, there have to be things exploiting the same mechanisms on those plants. So when we talk about all these different types of galls, I mean, that's probably like a splash in the pan when it comes to what these things are actually doing out there. It's just mind blowing. And you, you mentioned pollinators. It's a, I think that's a great example here because again, they're this thing we think of as a monolith, but it's really these many different interconnected networks 
And Gauls are really the same way where they just interact on so many different levels. It's kind of impossible to consider them as a singular unit. And oh my gosh, the, like you said, with them being so understudied, the opportunities here to learn and the questions to ask. And my brain's just going in a million different directions right now because I'm I think, ooh, what about this? And what about this? And what about that? And it's so interesting. And I think I can illustrate some of this unknown nature a little bit better when it comes to Gawa specifically. So currently there are about 1400 species known worldwide, about, about 700 of them are known from North America. The other 700 are from all over the place, but mostly again, Europe, some from Asia. But we speculate based on what we know about gall wasps, there are probably 1,000 to 1,500 species in North America alone. And that is based on projections from what we know about the known gall wasps. So that's excluding South America entirely, where there are most likely some really exceptional galls present. We're just talking about one part of the world that has been much more heavily sampled than other parts of the world. But within that heavy sampling, I mentioned these sylphium gall wasps. I mean, there are some aspects of gall wasps that haven't been well studied. So these herb gall wasps are a tremendous source of lack of data. Um, I've in the, in the room across the hall, I have about 20 species new to science that I've discovered just the past two years in North America. And that is focused on sampling in Midwestern prairie habitats alone. I mean, there's just so much to be discovered about these things. But one of the reasons for that is we've really only just discovered this is going to sound so funny. We've just discovered how much is undiscovered. <laughs> Before, we assumed a lot of these things have been looked for, but they just haven't been. We're realizing just how tremendous this paucity of research actually was over the past decades and centuries and so on. And you know, only through discovering new things can you understand how little was discovered before. So there's kind of this paradox that rears its head amongst within many research topics, not just Gauls. But it's crazy to me to think that you know, this is something that if you asked someone like, like Lewis Hart Weld in the mid 1900s, he would have said, we know a lot about Gauls. And now you ask someone in 2022 studying these things and they're like, we know nothing about Gauls. <laughs> and maybe um, Weld had some speculation as to how little we knew, but you know, there's just the level of complexity in what a gall is has just really started to become a major research topic in itself. Yes. And one, I'm going to have to follow more because I'm getting very interested. I mean, there's just so much to learn and to explore here. Absolutely. Well, in some of our emails and stuff, you were talking about ways that the public could get involved in some of this research and how amateurs could study. So, okay, I'm kind of hooked. What What's next? How? What can I yeah. do? Yeah. So one of the key elements I've developed as part of my research is this enormous expansive collaboration network. I have people sending me galls from all over North America. I'll go into the mail room one day and there'll be a box of galls from someone I've never corresponded with from a place I've never been to. And one thing that we've really been noticing is that the public has an interest in these things. They want to know what these things are. And, you know, I think that there hasn't really been the necessary push in science to involve the public in a lot of initiatives. And now we hear, you know, every scientist needs to be doing outreach, but that's a, that's a relatively new concept in the last 20 years, outreach as being a major component of science. So the best way for the public to get involved is, you know, go out and look for galls because odds are you will come across something nobody else on this planet has seen before. And I, I, I know that sounds like a high bar, I can walk down this street and I guarantee you, if I look closely enough, I will find a new species of gall somewhere on Penn State's campus. Again, a really heavily trafficked area. There will be a new gall species somewhere on this campus. It's just inevitable. And people are finding new species all the time. And through recent collaborations, they're making their way to people like me who will study them, describe those species and make them known to science. Uh, and the best way that I have been interacting with the public on this is through a platform called iNaturalist. And um, have, have you discussed iNaturalist on the show before? We discussed iNaturalist back almost two years ago when I was first starting the podcast. Okay. And then several other people have kind of brought it up and stuff. But it's one of those things that bring it up again. It's what I don't think you can yeah, hear absolutely. it too often. 
Yes, so iNaturalist is a community science platform where anyone, be that a scientist, a five-year-old kid, a random person can upload observations of nature in their own area. And that can be shared with a massive online community of, again, scientists, amateurs, random people who can then access that data, understand patterns of biodiversity, where things are found, how many species of things there are, and apply that data to their own research. And through iNaturalist, just from people posting photos, I mean, when I said I have around 20 new species, half of those are from things people have mailed me from our encounters on iNaturalist. And I, I found myself multiple times a week just going to iNaturalist and like getting all excited and thinking, what have people found today? Because people find the craziest, craziest things. And, you know, they just put them on there as if there's nothing interesting happening. And I'm like, you found a gall on what plan? And it's just like, really? I mean, there's nothing like opening iNaturalist and seeing someone has found what's probably a new species on a new host plant. There's nothing like that feeling. Just seeing that some person was on a hike thought nothing of it, snapped a photo and posted it. And you're like, you may have just solved a major question in gall wasp evolution without knowing. Like, it's just a really fun uh, feeling right there. But even the known species could use more work. So even just by taking a photo of a gall and posting it on Naturalist, you might find a new state record, which is quite a common occurrence. Someone might, you know, find a gall in Missouri that's only been seen in Kansas and and, you know, things like that happen a lot because, again, there's a paucity of research on a lot of these groups. And, you know, who better to find new things than people that are just out and about and exploring. And iNaturalist has been the most influential part of my graduate research so far. If, if people weren't out there actively trying to catalog these things, there just wouldn't be enough data to really elucidate a lot of the questions I'm currently trying to answer. And a lot of the iNaturalist data actually went into a manuscript I'd published uh, last summer that catalogs uh, many of the known species of gall wasp in North America. And many iNaturalist records we referenced for that were new state records. There were a couple that might even be new records of species that have been introduced to North America from other places. And you know, without a platform like iNaturalist and excited people to be exploring a lot of these things, we never would even expect to find some of these things where they are. And I'll plug my own research a little bit, since you specifically have found so much interest in sylphium, there are a lot of undescribed sylphium galls out there. So if you or any listeners encounter a weird growth on a rosin weed plant, I would love to hear about it. There are a lot of them out there, and they are a lot more common than we currently think they are. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of what it is, is having so many people out there looking and sharing because... If you see it every single day on your way home from work or growing along the side of the road or looking out your backyard or wherever in the county park, someplace that you're always at, you think, oh, yeah, it's normal. It's common. Everybody knows this. Everything that can be known is known about it. It's boring. It, it's just normal. And then a lot of times, or at least sometimes it's not, like you said, it could be completely new to science. It's just, everybody always overlooked it because it was normal and the right eyes haven't been on it, or it could be an endangered species or just all these different options and having everybody looking and sharing information can be so exciting and so helpful on so many different levels. Absolutely. And I see a really great example. This is my favorite example of something that was posted online. So there is a plant called Pyropapus, the desert chicory that's common in the uh, south central United States. And on this Pyropapus, uh, an iNaturalist observation went up showing galls on this plant. And they have, uh, spoilers, I'm going to come back and talk about this more. Um, it has turned out to be both a new genus and new species of gall wasp on this host plant. And the exceptionally crazy thing about it is these pyropapus are incredibly ephemeral plants. Their stems are available and active for, I speculate, a month or two months out of the year. A gall can form only on a short window of time. And these plants are common in lawns. So people are constantly mowing their lawns, getting rid of these plants. And the fact that someone found this gall is like a miracle. It's like this blip in time where like this was the one time where someone could have found this gall. And this was originally uh, mentioned to me by 
um, actually someone on Twitter. Social media is another great way to get involved. We can talk about that in a moment. Uh, but this call was first made aware to me by someone who posted them on Twitter and then later it added them to iNaturalist. But we also found a possible second host plant record for this skull through iNaturalist, a second species of pyropapus. Again, these ephemeral plants that are like there for a second and gone the next. And it's just such a crazy thing to think that, you know, the, not only are the odds of finding this plant so low, but someone came across it, thought it was interesting enough to photograph it and then went and posted it. Like the I just always think about the butterfly effects, right? Like if, if one of those things hadn't occurred, we wouldn't know about this gall wasp. And it's a, I think it'll fulfill an important piece of the puzzle of understanding the evolution of this lineage of herb gall wasps. And we wouldn't have it if someone hadn't gone there, found this plant that again was only available for that shortest window in time. It's just tremendous to me. Yeah, that that is. Um, Cause yeah, you just brought up another interesting point is that even if we just take all those things that could cause galls and just drop it down to insects, which is still very diverse, those insects probably aren't going to be active the entire year long. They're mm -hmm. not going to be able to, the plant's probably not going to be either available or available at a stage where the insect can use it for the entire year. So you've got all these different things that have to happen in order to have the galls even form and then absolutely and, and the timing on it and yeah there's just so many different pathways we could go down here absolutely and then there's the question of um to touch on this briefly how we study galls you know we don't just have to go and find the gall if we want to study the insects that make that gall we have to rear the gall and get those insects out and that similarly has its own unique changes so now we're talking about Insect needs to find plant. Insect needs to gall plant. Gall needs to form. Gall needs to survive. I need to then find that gall and it's take it back. I need to put it in conditions conducive to the insects inside surviving. And as we've mentioned, there are a lot of different parasites or other things that inhabit galls. I then need to pray that the insects in that gall are the ones that I'm looking for. And I then need to make sure that I get them out of that gall through their natural emergence process. So we're again talking about this just tremendously specific series of events, which is just mind blowing to me. If any one step in this process didn't go properly, then the whole thing collapses on itself. Yeah, because how do you know what conditions that insect in there needs to be able to be reared successfully in the lab? And how do you know that what comes out is what you thought it was to begin. I mean, if it's something totally Absolutely. new, how do you know that that's the insect that formed the gall and not a parasite of the insect that formed the gall? And that is a reason we have a lot of confusion on the top taxonomic end of things. People have named species assuming they're the gall inducer only to later realize they're a parasite or there's something else entirely. We've had species move around between families because people have put it in the gall wasp family, assuming it's a true gall wasp, but it's really some parasite all this crazy, crazy stuff. And to add more complexity, I can't believe I didn't mention this earlier, there are not just parasites of galls, there is a branch of gall wasps that are what we call inquilines, and they will basically take over existing galls in a way unique from parasitoids. Again, these are a true branch of gall wasps, so they've evolved from gall-inducing insects, but have re-evolved the capacity to lay their eggs in existing galls. Their offspring will outcompete the gall wasps already in there, and then they will take over the gall and be the thing that emerges at the very end. Oh, wow. so that's another challenge, both to rearing galls and the survival and perpetuation of a gall wasp lineage. So just so many, so many, like just, just talking about this, I feel like I need to go over to the board and start making a flow chart. Like I, I feel like it's so hard to really understand how many moving parts there are in this type of an ecosystem. It's just phenomenal. Yes, but oh my gosh, this is, I knew this was going to be a fascinating and interesting discussion. And this has just been even more than I ever dreamed it would be because, yeah, there are so many different parts here and so many different yeah. directions you could go. Yeah, one of my lab mates and I have been talking about, you know, we need a gall podcast because I've done a couple of podcasts now talking about galls and wasps and things, but like there's never enough time to really dive into anything because we can outline all the cool topics, but like, 
oh, I could go on and on for hours about like what actually is happening inside a gall, how the different organisms are interacting, how we know how host associations have developed all this crazy stuff. And it's like, we only have so much time to cover all these tremendous topics. Yes. Well, definitely have to think about having you on again and going deeper in some of this stuff because I mean, yes, there's so many different, different fun and exciting and interesting areas that we could go into that we've just barely even touched on and others that we've kind of hinted at and my mind's like blown and going all the way over in this other direction and knowing that's way too deep of a rabbit hole to even think about bringing up that topic right now. Absolutely. (laughs) And I can tell by some of the things you've said that you're probably doing the exact same thing with it. Whenever I'm doing something like so, I have to always, always think to myself, if I mention that thing, I have to mention this other thing and I have to mention this other thing. And it's just this massive change. And a lot of that's natural in a conversation like this. But at the same time, I feel like I have to be so selective as, as to what I bring up because galls are such this, again, enormous, enormous topic. Every gall is so unique. And, you know, anything I say will need 30 layers of context that will inevitably introduce something else that needs more context. And it's just. Yes. And especially talking to somebody like me who loves these different avenues and thinking and then it's like oh wait a minute what about this so what about those benefits to the plants and that just (laughs) brings up a whole nother level of conversations and sends us down another rabbit hole and direction that wasn't even in your original 30 layers of things that you thought we were going to talk about absolutely but yes so anything else that you think we need to talk about today Yeah, so I will once more emphasize iNaturalist being an incredibly important tool uh, for research, not just on galls, but just on life in general. Um, I mean, I mostly interact with the gall end of things, but there are always amazing things being posted, not just as far as what people are seeing, but there's some really talented photographers out there. I mean, just browsing that website is a way to spend probably a decade of your life without moving from your chair. It is a great resource. If you see a gall, you know, ask someone about it. Again, it could be something new, something undiscovered that no one's ever seen before. Um, social media is a great way to get your observations out there in addition to things like iNaturalist. Uh, I will note though that a lot of gall experts are regularly checking iNaturalist, so that might be the best place to get answers to your questions. But otherwise, yeah, galls are amazing. They're truly fascinating. And even as someone that's been studying them for a few years now, I mean, I am barely scratching the surface and I'm the only person to work on on this group of gall wasps in the last century for the most part. So they're a great topic. Definitely, uh, I think they're worth exploring for anyone that finds them fascinating enough. And it's always amazing to be able to say something like, I'm the first person that's done this work in a century. (laughs) I mean, I'm sorry, there's just something fun and exciting about that. There's something exciting about it until you realize, you know, there are hundreds or thousands of groups of insects not even animals but just insects specifically that that's the same thing for yeah so I mean I I I, sure I get that it feels like there's this air of like intrigue to it but I'm sitting here like yeah well I'm just carving out this little tiny sliver of the puzzle over here meanwhile the Atlantic Ocean's worth of insects are not being explored which is Mm -hmm. There's a whole, there, there's a podcast episode in there, but what we call the taxonomic impediment, the idea that not enough people are actively performing taxonomic research, finding new species, looking at existing species. That's a whole episode right there. But I mean, what I'm working on is like the tiniest, furthest cave, like from everything else. There's so much to be done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I thought of something else. Absolutely. We keep talking about iNaturalist and posting your pictures of galls and stuff. Okay. What do you need? What, what type of pictures do we take? Because I mean, with an Ooh. insect, it's like, oh yeah, you take the picture of the insect and you kind of got a feel for what, but it's a growth on a plant. What kind of pictures do you want from us? So the good thing is the theme of your podcast, Backyard Ecology. I'm guessing that many of your listeners have a moderate background on the plants they're looking at. The most important thing to knowing what a gall is is knowing what plant it's on. A species would be great. A genus is really, really solid because um, many, specifically in the herb gall wasps, if you know the host genus, you almost always know the gall wasp genus. For oaks, it's a little dicier because there's a massive radiation of gall wasps on oaks, so we do need a species when possible. But we need to know, again, the host plant as best as possible. 
the plant tissue that it's on. So if it's on the leaf, if it's on the stem, if it's on the root uh, is always helpful. And honestly, as many photos as you can get of that thing as possible. Um, a lot of galls, it's obvious what they are, but for some species, you need to see where does it meet the tip of the stem? Are there little leaflets coming off of it or is it a smoother surface? All these really amazing, amazing questions. But generally, a good rule of thumb, at least for common galls, if you know the plant and you know the structure and the very vague appearance of the gall, you often will know what it is. But like I said, there's so much unknown about, about galls out there that honestly, you just got to pray you have the right information and send it out there. There's really, there's really no perfect guidance once we have that basic information. And does size matter? I mean, like on most things, having a scale of some sort, your thumb or pen or something in there to give a scale is helpful. Is that true with galls too? Yeah, a scale can be generally helpful. Um, usually galls are pretty much the same size on a given plant. Uh, there are some weird cases where that's not always true. Um, there are some galls that are what we call collaborative galls, where they're, uh, the gall itself is formed by multiple different gall wasps laying eggs in the same plant tissue all at once, and that can influence the size of the gall. But the average gall is usually going to be pretty similar in size most of the time. Uh, scale is obviously helpful, but I'd say for something like an insect, having a scale is generally more essential. Okay. Now, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole because I know we're getting a little long here, but you just said collaborative galls. <laughs> you know I had to throw something else there right at you the just end. Said yes. <laughs> yeah. Is that the same species? Is that multiple different species? Uh, yeah. so, uh, the species I mentioned earlier, the one that's giving us these weird species versus host questions, the Antistrophus sylphiae, the rosin weed terminal stem gall wasp, is a really good example of this. Uh, it seems that depending on how many female gall wasps of that species lay eggs on that stem at the same time, the actual size the gall swells to is different. And that makes sense when you think about the structure of a gall, how each gall wasp in that particular case is an individual chamber on the inside of the gall. You know, having more eggs laid means more gall wasps hatch, which means more chambers form, and therefore the tissue expands further. But we see that in quite a number of galls on herbaceous plants. Interesting. Okay, I've got to ask. <laughs> I was trying not to. <laughs> what would be the evolutionary advantage of having these collaborative galls and gall wasps there? Because it seems like, well, usually the insect in the gall, from my understanding, is usually the larva. Yes. Okay. Why would you put a bunch of them together when that seems like it would attract more parasites to it? Whereas, and the larva doesn't have a defensive mechanism. I mean, it's not like having a collaborative nesting of some sort of insect that could have a protective aspect there. Is it just simply overwhelming the parasite and maybe mine won't be the one that gets eaten or parasitized? So this idea of collaborative galls, in my understanding, is actually fairly new. I don't know that we actually know anything <laughs> about the actual evolutionary advantage. Uh, one thing it could be is, and this is definitely some essential context for this, when gall wasps are laying their eggs, when they're ovipositing, it doesn't necessarily need to be all simultaneously. So that doesn't mean you have six gall wasps all on the stem at once, all laying eggs. It could mean that over the course of several days, you know, five different gall wasps visit that stem and legs in the same place. Um, in the case of that, the one species I mentioned, Antistrophus sylphiae, they prefer a very specific spot on the stem. So it could just be they're all there and laying eggs because that's the ideal host plant and that's the ideal part of the plant. It could just be incidental. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I think is always fun to highlight is we often assume that any behavior has a really specific and strict evolutionary advantage. It could just be by random chance, but that's the way it works out. Uh, these collaborative galls are definitely an area that is in desperate need of further research, but I don't know too much about them, to be honest, besides the fact that they exist. <laughs> yeah, it was just, well, was, wait a minute, but, but, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we always assume advantage and it, it's more often than not really probably is just because as Absolutely. the answer. Just because. Okay, so we probably should stop here. <laughs>
<laughs> or else we will be doing a three hour podcast. Yes. We could do that if that's we something your viewers that. would find but, tolerable. Yes, but yes, this has been very, very fascinating and very interesting. And thank you so much for talking with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been really exciting. And I feel like I don't get to talk about Gauls enough outside of the context of like other Gaul people. So it's always really fun to get those wild questions. Because I mean, you know, when you're when you're developing expertise on something, you're interacting with the same group of people who already kind of have the same assumptions. So for instance, those people would already have assumed, you know, we don't really know why that exists. Whereas someone coming from outside that discipline gets to ask those questions and still develop and contribute to that discussion in a way that otherwise isn't possible. So I'm really, really thankful that we got to have some of those really interesting conversations because I don't get to have those quite frequently. Oh, you're welcome. And if people want to reach out to you and ask questions or say, oh, wow, I just found this really weird thing. What's what's going on here? Can they do that? Absolutely. So I am quite active on Twitter generally, and I have what I think is probably the best Twitter handle ever. I am at too many wasps. <laughs> uh, other than that, I am also available on iNaturalist. Uh, you can find all kinds of awesome gall content there. If you post a weird herb gall and you identify it as a gall wasp, I will absolutely be the one to look at it. So that is another option. Um, other than that, for anyone that's curious, not just about galls, but wasps in general, there's also the wasp ID course that we are running this coming January. We had our first session last year. We had 326 attendees from all over the world. We had all continents, but Antarctica and over 40 countries. This is completely through Zoom. So no one's having to fly all over the place, but we cover identification and biology of every single extant group of wasps, including the gall wasps. So if that's something that interests you, uh, maybe we can have a link for that in the description. Yes. Um, that is the WASP ID course. That'll be January, 2023. Other than that, uh, let's say iNaturalist is the go-to place for anything related to galls. Sounds great. Yeah, and I'll have your Twitter contact if that's okay. Absolutely. In the show notes, as well as the iNaturalist. Um, because, well, you can't put iNaturalist in too many times in the show notes. Absolutely. And then also, of course, to your WASP ID class, too, because that sounds really interesting as well. It's going to be a great time. We have 19 instructors that are going to be doing lectures for it. It's going to be great. Ooh, nice. Well, yeah. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you. I really appreciate Lewis taking the time to talk with us today. I am completely fascinated and intrigued by galls now. I want to know so much more about them and could easily have kept asking questions and learning about galls for at least another hour. I'm sure we'll be hearing from Lewis again on a variety of topics. But if you'd like for us to do a deeper dive and exploration of a specific gall related topic, please let me know. And if you would like to keep up with everything that is happening in the backyard ecology world, I encourage you to sign up for our free weekly emails at www.backyardecology.net slash subscribe. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.